Step into the future of game monetization with Exola, the premier partner for game developers seeking to expand their reach and revenue. Exola provides a robust suite of tools designed to enhance user acquisition, demanded subscriptions, and streamline payment solutions worldwide. Unlock new markets and maximize profitability through their customized, secure payment architecture and dedicated support team. Exola, powering game developers to achieve global success. This podcast is brought to you by Data AI. Now, you're asking, didn't they get acquired by Sensor Tower? They did. And that's awesome. Here's why. Whether you loved using data.ai or Sensor Tower, the combined company will offer customers even stronger and more detailed insights on the full digital customer journey. Exciting times lie ahead as Sensor Tower Data AI join forces. Go to data.ai or sensortower.com and get on board with undeniably the best data partner in the business. Now, back to the episode. Hello, my name is Adam Telfer, and I'm here speaking with Devin Brennan from Yuzu regarding their latest market report. Yeah, first off, really excited to be here. I've been a longtime listener of the podcast, so it's super cool to finally be on here. As you mentioned, I'm with Nuzu. I'm actually a senior consultant from Nuzu. Spent the better part of the last four years working with different game developers and publishers across the globe, helping them with both their publishing strategy as well as their kind of assessment of the overall market and how they want to approach different spaces. Beyond Nuzu, what's your job history? Beforehand, I was a consultant at Deloitte tech consultant. And then even earlier than that, I was uh, pursuing a startup in the video game space focused around discoverability for indies. But that's a, a long time ago. Okay. All right. So this is why we're digging into indies today. This is great. <laughs> yeah. Yes, great absolutely. Have. All right. Great to meet you. Before we get into a ton of details here on the news reports, I'd love to chat a little bit about how news pulls together these reports and like how the data is extrapolated. Can you go into that? Yeah, absolutely. So as a, as a warning, there's a lot. Really, we're pulling in information from so many sources. It sometimes is hard to keep track of. But to structure this a little bit, with our core global games market report, there are really two main metrics. Uh, one is the players and payers. And then the other side is the revenues. And for the players and payers, how we get there is a combination of our own primary research from our global gamer study where we go to 36 markets and do online interviews with over 70,000 participants. And that helps give us an understanding of the distribution of players and payers in those markets. We then combine that with online population metrics from UN, as well as internet penetration metrics from ITU to get to those player and payer type figures. And then the second part of that is the revenues where we are actually combining an immense amount of different sources. So we dig into over 140 companies' detailed financial information. We combine that with our own live game level tracking of engagement and revenue. We also have partner data from folks like AppTweak to help with mobile. And then lastly, we pull in macroeconomic figures like household income and GDP per capita and GDP per capita from UN and other major bodies. Amazing. Okay. And on the players and peers run, you also have that live data in terms of Dow, WoW, Mal, at a title level that you're estimating. Does that factor into the player counts or is that mostly just extrapolations from your um, survey data? So for the players and payers, the total sizing, they're really the macro sizing figures. Those individual engagement metrics, we don't factor in. We do compare and, and see if there's an alignment across these two different methodologies, but those don't initially factor into the modeling for those player and payer figures. Interesting. Okay, great. So in terms of today, we've chatted a little bit and looked at the report. We're going to split this up into three different sections. First, let's talk a little bit about general market trends in terms of where the, the market is growing. Second section, we'll be talking about premium games in terms of the current status of sort of single player premium games, as well as diving into the status of double A and indie games. And then lastly, looking into the sort of future prospects of live service on PC console, all very, very important. 
But let's first dive into general market trends in terms of what's growing, shrinking, and why. I've read through the report, obviously, looking forward to the report every single time it comes out to start taking into the data, starting to figure out how, how things are changing. The global market is now expected to grow at roughly 2.1% year over year in 2024. How does that compare to sort of earlier forecasts that you could have done? Yeah. So, so to contextualize this number, because for some that might sound optimistic, for some that might sound pessimistic, some extra context to provide here is in, say, the three years leading up to COVID, so 2017, 2018, and 2019, we forecasted the market was growing at roughly a 4.9%. So that's before the impact of COVID on the games market. So it's important to note here that when we're forecasting we are returning to growth, this is not the same level of growth that the overall market was experiencing before the impact of COVID on the market. However, we are happy to say that the market is returning to growth. Last year in 2023, we forecasted that it was quite flat. So we are on a positive trajectory when we look at growth over this year and the coming years. Okay, so in terms of pre-COVID rates of that 4.9%, the flattening through 2023, now we're back into 2.1. But in terms of comparing this to like May or to your January forecasts, how has that outlook changed? Because I know like if I remember previous news reports, we were talking pretty pessimistically about the games market. Is this a more bullish outlook of where games is going? So it's, it's slightly more bullish. We were a bit more conservative with our initial estimates for 2024. We expected it to be a bit more flat. However, we have seen some initial early indications in the year that have made us slightly more positive, but a very marginal increase in our overall expectation for the year. Okay, I will take that marginal optimism. Let's, <laughs> let's dive right into it. That might be the theme for the podcast episode, marginal optimism. Marginal optimism, <laughs> I like that. Okay. What do you believe are the key drivers of that sort of like marginal optimism right now of what's changed since since the previous por- forecast? So there's two different segments that are actually growing when we look in 2024. The first is mobile. We actually see mobile returning to growth for the first time in a little while since really the peak of COVID and the impact of the privacy changes. The reason for why we think mobile is returning to growth is partly due to the improvements of many economies across the globe, combined with several heavy hitter mobile titles performing very well in this year already. So mobile is one factor. We can dive a bit deeper into that in a second. PC is the other factor, and it's actually the fastest growing segment this year. PC is quite an interesting platform in that it now has a very sound foundational base of live service revenues that are very stable and predictable, typically coming from titles like League of Legends, Counter-Strike, Dota, Valorant, titles that are exclusive to the PC platform. And on top of that stable level of revenue, we're also seeing a nice boost from the cross-platform strategies that primarily PlayStation is executing on with many of their first-party franchises arriving on PC this year giving a nice boost to the segment as a whole. Amazing. Okay. And before we kind of go into the platform specifics in terms of mobile and PC console, what about regions? Is there any sort of like regions specifically that are underperforming or overperforming right now? Uh, So from a regional perspective, the ones that are underperforming slightly are... (laughs) Slightly underperformance. Okay. (laughs) Slightly (laughs) underperforming. Marginally, maybe, is a better word. (laughs) are really the more developed nations. So North America, Western Europe, and uh, Japan. And that's because the one segment that's underperforming is the console segment. The console segment is the segment that is most reliant on having a strong slate of AAA releases in a year. And this year, we're quite light on that. And so because of that, it's a bit of a reduction in growth for the regions where console is most prevalent, which is typically Japan, Western Europe, and North America, whereas the actually the emerging regions, the mobile first markets, markets like Middle East and Africa, Latin America, and Southeast Asia, Central Asia are really strongly growing. And a lot of that is fueled by the improving internet infrastructure 
as well as accessibility of mobile phones becoming quite cheap in those markets and a rising middle class as well in many of those countries. Interesting. Okay. Let's dive first into that console comment you made in terms of this year, the slate being relatively weak, especially when we compare you over here. And that's why the decline, I think it's a 1% decline now in console. When I compare that to say last year, what was the growth rate of console last year, given the strength of that slate? So I think it ended up being at a couple percentage points. I think it was around 2% or slightly above 2% growth last year. But coming into 2023, we actually forecasted a higher growth rate for console because of the projected release slate and how strong it was going to be. And what we found out during the year when we were digging into company financials is that those AAA releases were far more cannibalistic on the existing live service revenue in the console market. And it was actually the PC market where the live service revenue was more resilient and it had a bigger boost from the AAA release slate. So in 2023, in our revised forecast, PC actually outgrew a console because of that impact. Interesting. So did you really see data that was showing that cannibalization from people, say, purchasing Zelda and Hogwarts and, and Baldur's Gate, that it was cannibalizing engagement or, all, or just revenue in terms of live services? So both. When we dug into specific public company financials, those companies that had live service titles, but not necessarily large releases in those quarters. So for example, I think Take-Two with Rockstar and GTA revenues in those period in time, so we saw dips that corresponded to launches of major AAA titles. But we also saw it in our tracking data with our monthly active users and revenue data where we could see dips in those live service titles that corresponded to the releases of those major AAA titles. Interesting. Okay, so then this year, obviously, the slate is weaker. Sorry, Star Wars Evolves. I like it. I'm going to play it. But the next year, we've got GTA 6. So as we start to look a little bit into the future, is the expectation that console will grow next year with GTA 6, or will it be another repeat of what happened in 2023 where GTA 6 eats all of our lunches. <laughs> no, actually, I'm happy to say that we're, we're quite optimistic for 2025, that it'll, it'll be a good year for the industry, not just for Rockstar and Nintendo. And that's a few different reasons. But of course, GTA 6 is the, the 9,000 pound gorilla in the room of this conversation. We do expect it will have probably the largest launch in the history of probably AAA PC console titles. But we don't think it's going to suck the total air out of the year so much that other publishers and developers suffer. So we do actually believe that in 2025, console and PC are actually going to slightly flip and that console is one of the fastest growing segments of that year. Okay. And then how does that continue? Because I'm assuming as a, let's say, as not Nintendo and not GTA 6 as a developer, I'm trying to say, like, what, where should it be placing my bets? I mean, is the PC console as a combined bucket growing through that time? Or are you saying that like they're just kind of swapping rank? Yes. So PC will still be growing. We do expect PC to grow through that period of time, 2025 through till 2027. So combined, when we're looking at PC and console, we do expect both of them to grow. And to build on that, when we're talking about other developers in the space as they're planning for 2025, I know... I've spoken with several of them. They are, of course, looking to avoid any launches in fall of next year. But there's an interesting additional consideration here with GTA 6, and that's it is only launching on next generation consoles. And it is going to be a very strong motivator for a lot of the more patient console players or patient PC players to finally make that generational upgrade. And 2025 has a really strong release slate outside of GTA 6. Titles like Civilization 7, Avowed, Monster Hunter Wilds, Fable, Doom. And a lot of those titles are only coming out on next generation consoles and PC. So the fact that GTA 6 is pushing people to finally convert and upgrade to those next generation consoles could have knock on benefits for those other titles that are releasing specifically to next generation consoles as well. Interesting. Okay. And that kind of implies that 
the, the current health of this generation. Do you have a sense there in terms of where PlayStation and Xbox are in terms of their attachment rates versus previous generation? Yeah, so there's a happy story and a, and a difficult story there as well. So from a broad perspective, comparing old generation to new generation for Xbox and PlayStation, we're kind of at an even 50-50 split. So from an active install base, roughly half of PlayStation's active install base is still on PlayStation 4 and the same for Xbox as well. So we still have a very sizable active install base that is on the previous generation and we're hoping to see in 2025 quite a shift of those players up to the next generation largely motivated uh, by gta 6 but we can dive a bit deeper into uh some of those platforms i think xbox there's a bit more yeah let's definitely dive in on xbox because i want to get your sense of like the, the health of that platform obviously with the recent news around microsoft moving to more cross-platform releases what's the health right now of the xbox platform this is a tough one for me. It hits a little close to home, Adam. i got to be honest with you because I grew up on the 360. Uh, Halo and Gears of War are some of my personal favorite franchises. But i got to be honest, it's not been a good couple generations for Xbox. And this is no secret. I think people know this and understand this very well. As it sits right now, the active install base for Xbox is roughly half what PlayStation's active install base is. And while the Xbox One was definitely a big miss for Xbox, the Series X has not been performing that much better. It's interesting to note that actually in the initial months of the Series X launch, it was outpacing Xbox One sales. But of course, that was a big benefit from COVID. But now that we're quite a bit removed from the impact of COVID, the Series X has actually fallen behind the sales pace of the Xbox One, which is a very worrying sign, of course, for the hardware side of Xbox, especially now when you're adding in the new Xbox cross-platform strategy, where they are essentially eliminating any motivation to have an Xbox from a content perspective if you're able to get access to a PC. Yeah, and so... Th- in terms of news forecasts, are you pretty bearish then in terms of what the tail of Xbox will look like in this generation? Yes. Yeah, generally, we don't have a marginal optimism for the outlook of this generation of Xbox. And it'll be a very interesting question to see what the next generation of Xbox consoles look like. I'm concerned that a simple technological leap will not be enough and, and could see a very significant additional drop off in install base for xbox in the future okay we're shifting gears then to the switch 2 what's newsy's outlook in terms of the switch 2's prospects yeah this is this is a fun one because we're not far away from the launch but we actually don't really know a whole lot and i mean so what we do know is nintendo has had a massive success with switch it is by far the largest active install base of all of the consoles at the moment It's been super successful over the last eight years. But looking at Nintendo's history, they've had a bit of a struggle transitioning their players across generations. Of course, Wii to Wii U is the example that's going to immediately come up, where there was quite a lot of struggle transitioning those players across. However, Nintendo's transmedia strategy has been incredibly effective over the last few years. It's both help them unlock certain markets that they've underperformed in. It's also brought back churned players who had stopped playing with the Switch to really help boost those active install base. And the timing is really good for the Switch too. By all rumors and what Nintendo has been saying, there are no supply constraints. See if that plays out. But they're saying there are no supply constraints, that they're aiming to have enough stock to avoid any issues with scalpers. So... There are a lot of tailwinds behind this launch for Switch, but also I would highlight that the Nintendo Switch was probably the platform that benefited the most from COVID. The reason I say this is because it has the broadest demographic of users for the platform, and it also captures the largest amount of casual users. And it was those casual users that we really saw boosted during COVID. 
And that was one of the parts that has made Nintendo Switch such a successful console. But obviously those market dynamics are no longer there with this launch of Switch 2. So what that will mean for the console is yet to be seen, but it'll be very interesting to see how that plays out next year. Interesting. Yeah, no, certainly things like Animal Crossing, New Horizons. I remember that moment during COVID and just the sales figures coming out and how impressive that launch was. And it absolutely made sense at that zeitgeist of a time. But with Switch 2 not having those market dynamics and as well, obviously everything is just speculation at this point around the technical changes towards their Switch 2 feels like it is just that technical we so far. Obviously, let's wait for Nintendo's announcement. But if it is just that like incremental technical leap, do you expect this to be a repeat of the Switch to so Switch generation or like a or a significant decrease? It's tough to say at the moment. We don't exactly know what the release slate of these titles are going to be. I expect this will be very dependent on having a very strong first party release slate. Of course, we know about Metroid Prime, which should be good. I imagine they'll have a, a Mario title to accompany it along with several other titles. But will they have a Breath of the Wild type title to help convert people to this next generation? It's tough to predict. I think a lot of Switch 2 is going to ride on whether or not Nintendo is able to bring compelling next-gen content that is going to really push Switch users to make that upgrade. Yeah. yeah. And even as a like massive Metroid nerd as I am, <laughs> I don't think Metroid Prime will be the, the console for sure, unfortunately. Okay, so let's circle back to PC before we get into mobile. So you talked a lot about the rise of PC. Is it all Steam or is it all storefronts? Yeah, yeah I mean, the short answer is yes, it's all Steam, unless you're part of the very exclusive club of developers and publishers who have been able to successfully manage their own proprietary storefronts. Riot Games is the, the main example here. Of course, Blizzard as well with Blizznet. As far as competition for a general storefront, Steam is still king. I think Epic, last year they did their Epic Game Store year in review. And within that, they mentioned that there was roughly 300 million in annual revenue from third-party game sales on their platform. And that was a 13% year-over-year decrease. So 300 million, that that is a very small chunk of the overall pie steam far 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 exceeds that so steam is very much still king when it comes to distribution on pc then in your report you're talking a lot about pc being kind of the benefactor of cross-platform play that like a rise of pc has been of a lot of games coming onto that platform um so xbox bringing pc games sony bringing pc games can you go into more detail on that yeah absolutely I mean, so historically, PC has kind of always been seen as the the pinnacle of the gaming platform. Gamers will talk about upgrading from a console to PC. They won't talk about upgrading from a PC to an Xbox. So it's always been seen as the pinnacle of gaming by core gamers. But the biggest drawback for PC has always been there is a significant amount of content that you cannot get if you do not have one of these consoles. Of course, there's also a cost barrier typically with PC as well. But still, within these core gamer groups that have that disposable income, it was really the content exclusivity that was the major drawback for PC gamers. Well, now, if you're willing to be patient, there's no reason to own any consoles because all Xbox titles are going to come to PC and PlayStation will launch all their live service titles day one and their tentpole franchises probably after a one to two year delay. So the patient PC gamers and really the PC segment as a whole are the true winners. And to highlight this, when we looked at the top 200 games by monthly active users across PC, Xbox, and PlayStation so far in 2024, only 11 of those 200 titles were not available on PC. And seven of those were PlayStation exclusive titles six of which will probably eventually end up on PC within the next two years. So that just kind of goes to show you PC players essentially now have access to any and all PC console franchises. I'm thinking about this as a player experience where over the last years on PC, yes, they have gotten PC games on the platform, but they have typically been buggy 
or like ports, right? Like they were yeah. obviously built for console first with PC as a secondary. Kind of extrapolating from this insight, like would your advice then be to developers to prioritize PC over console moving forward in terms of the, the target platform? Or would it continue to be console first port to PC? There are some genre nuances in the type of genre in the game. Of course, say if you're making a sports title, then absolutely you need to be focusing on console still over PC. But for most genres, I would recommend that PC is as high of a priority as console, if not a higher priority than consoles. Uh, I think, unfortunately, probably Xbox is on the priority list, will need to be at the bottom with PC and PlayStation at the top. Interesting. And with Xbox as well being that split generation, are you seeing a low attach rate at the Series S level versus the Series X? Like, do developers need to prioritize or like work on Xbox and on the Series S? It is a bit of a cost benefit analysis at a certain point, but my expectation would be for most developers, the additional TAM that you get access to with the Series S does not justify the cost of porting or kind of descaling your game to make it available on that platform, just based on the install base. Interesting. Great. Um, I know it's all speculation, but it's still yeah, like... Yeah. Yeah. It's important questions. These are important yep. questions. Yep. Exactly. And as well, we've also seen a lot of sort of like mobile games move over to PC, including things like on Steam. Are you seeing success there? And like, what's kind of the commonality about that success? So... The transition of mobile to PC is a very interesting one because there's a few different ways in which mobile developers are approaching this. The most obvious one are really the direct ports where people are just taking their mobile game and slapping it through a port company and then putting it on PC. We have not really seen a high level of success with that approach to the market. I think personally, the far more interesting approach is, say, a, a shift up the Korean developer behind Nikkei, who essentially used the success of Nikkei to fund the development of Stellar Blade, a title specifically meant for the console market. That is, I think, a more winning formula than just making a straight port of a mobile game onto PC. I think all you're really doing with that is getting more engagement out of the player's that you already have as mobile players because now they can play on a few more platforms. Interesting. Yeah, no, I would say the shift up example is a rare one in terms of the developer being able to have that skill set so broad, being able to build, you know, AAA blockbuster titles as well as, you know, very, very successful mobile. Like I'm all the power to shift up, but I don't believe a lot of developers have both of those capabilities all in house at the same time. So kudos yeah, to shift I think that's fair. I think that's definitely fair. So then kind of transitioning into mobile, we talked a little bit about that, like mobile is now expected to grow roughly 3% year over year. And now you're you're starting to say like a little bit more bullish, like slightly positive, <laughs> marginally positive expectations on mobile. You were mentioning things like heavy hitter titles driving that significant growth. Can you go into more details about what those titles are? There are two different categories of heavy hitters, I would say. There is really the tried and true heavy hitters that have been around for a long time. Uh, these are Honor of Kings, uh, Royal Match, PUBG Mobile, <clears throat> Roblox. These are really consistent revenue drivers for the mobile platform. But we've really had some new entrants to the space as well. A lot has been said about Monopoly Go uh, and their really incredible 2023. That incredible 2023 has still translated into an incredible 2024. They reported themselves that by end of July, they were up to $3 billion, which was up from $2 billion in March. So incredible results. Another one to point out is DNF Mobile in China, which Tencent launched in May 2024. And it's already the third highest grossing game in China, reaching around half a billion just in one market alone. So really an incredible success story and in, in terms of like the most mobile developers are not monopoly go are not <laughs> dnf are from cutting out those sort of like major blockbuster releases how is kind of the overall prospects for 
the average mobile developer changing? I think it's a very tricky market. Unfortunately, it seems to be a very top heavy market where we don't see a lot of mid-tier developers with new entrants that are able to get a very steady level of success. There's been a lot of, uh, within each of the different genres, a lot of winner take most type realities. And unfortunately, I think with the privacy changes that happened, they didn't really benefit anybody, but the biggest companies that have multiple games out in the marketplace were the ones that had the most amount of data and could really rebound or handle that situation the best. So I am a bit concerned about what the future for smaller mobile developers looks in like in that space. And so I guess my key insight here is like that obviously the market is growing. Those heavy hitters are continuing to grow. We are marginally positive on the mobile outlook right now, but marginally negative in terms of mobile developers going after new entrants, especially ones that don't have sort of like entrenched franchises that they can leverage data and audiences that they can leverage. Yeah. If I was to put one additionally positive note on for those smaller developers, as we see these mobile ecosystems open up and more third-party app stores come into the space, there is potentially an avenue for discoverability for these smaller developers within these third-party app stores. But we still don't know for sure how successful these third-party app stores are going to be in actually bringing users into them. But if that does happen, then I can see that being a opening for mid-tier developers to gain visibility on their titles and better discoverability. Great. This podcast is brought to you by Apps Flyer. In today's digital world, understanding your app's journey from discovery to download is more than just insightful, it's essential. Enter Apps Flyer, the leader in mobile attribution and marketing analytics that allows you to measure the full potential of your marketing efforts, making every ad dollar work smarter. With Apps Flyer, that's your new reality. Dive deep into data-driven insights that reveal exactly where your users come from and how they'll interact with your app. Apps Flyer, where your app's potential meets performance. You've heard of Heroic Labs by now, and we keep talking about them because in today's mature market, you need every edge to be successful. Rather than spending those precious company dollars on building game tech, focus on building your game and shipping it. Get into your players' hands faster and grow your community. Heroic Labs is battle-tested partner and friend of the podcast. Their tech enables you to be flexible, creative, and scale for success. Heroic Labs has your tech stack covered. Whether you're looking for a world-class backend game server, an amazing game development framework, fantastic live ops tooling, or reliable mass scalability, Heroic Labs has solutions for all of these challenges. And it's not just us at Deconstructor of Fun praising Heroic Labs. The company works with some of the world's biggest publishers on many of the beloved games. Focus on your game, save a big chunk of cheese, and avoid tech risks with Heroic Labs. So I feel like we've covered enough of general market trends that was in depth. So that was the first topic. The second topic, let's get into sort of like premium game outlook, getting into single player games, double A and indie titles. So what's been most interesting to me in this report is looking through your, your thesis on this report around single player games. Just to kind of set this up, how have forecasts for sort of box games or non-live service games changed since COVID? It actually has not shifted much at all. We've seen a fairly consistent contribution of these single player, these premium titles in the market. And even when we look at, say, the revenue distribution by channel or type of purchase in 2023, both on PC and console, roughly 54% of revenue in Western markets came from the premium purchase of games. So the premium, the upfront purchase of titles still counts for the majority of revenue within the Western PC and console markets. And that stayed fairly consistent over the past few years as well. And when we look to the future, we don't see that shifting significantly. Interesting. Okay. So, and also through these last few years, we talked about last year in the slate, but I think we tend to kind of stick with certain examples on our hand. And the assumption has been that, you know, the work is growing and you're getting bigger and bigger blockbusters. So I think of like 
10 years ago and like what a single player game would sell. And then now you're hearing headlines of things like Hogwarts reaching 12 million in a month, littering 12 million in a month. Helldivers, I think 12 million was their recent headline. Call World obviously having a stellar January and Diablo's monster launch. How do we sort of put these the context of these like monster launches in that like, hey, box products have mostly been a stable market these last years? They definitely show you what the upside of that type of business model is. And these are obviously outliers in today's market. The vast majority of premium games entering the market will hit some fraction of the sales that these titles will hit. But what I want developers to take away from this is in a time when we're so much focused on things like multi-game subscriptions from Xbox Game Pass and PlayStation Plus to discussing live service business models and free to play, the tried and true pay to play straight premium model is still an incredibly effective and successful strategy in today's market. It has stayed successful and commercially viable over the past five to 10 years. And it will very likely continue to be commercially viable as we look to the future. That is, I think, for me, the big takeaway and what I would want developers to think of when they see the performance of those titles. Yeah. But when we talk about sort of like commercially viable, let's get into profitable. Because when we talk about like revenue being roughly flat, these large titles taking up a chunk. We've also heard stories of like franchise over franchise, sequel over sequel, declines in units or stabilization of units while costs have gone up significantly. Your report kind of goes through a thesis about like, hey, how to how do we control for this and, and build the right commercially successful products? Do you want to go into that? Yeah, absolutely. So of course, there's a few different levers on what affects the cost of titles. And one of those that we think has somewhat ballooned out of a necessary proportion is the length and sometimes the scope of single player titles. Some of these titles are reaching 60, 70, 80 hour play times, which just might be unnecessary in today's market and today's entertainment landscape. We dove into a bunch of these large single player titles and looked at what was the lifetime play time of users within these titles. And what we saw over and over in many of these titles <clears throat> was that the average was roughly 21 to 25 hours lifetime playtime in these games. So the actual completion rate of these games was quite low overall. And I think this idea that these titles need to be quite long is a bit of a relic of the past when game time length, say 10 years ago, was one of the main feedback criteria any game reviewer would put first. And it was a priority for users to understand how much value per dollar they were getting. But today's consumer is far less concerned about hour per dollar they spend on a game. This is even in the context of sort of the, the $70 price point increase that you're seeing that games that have that shorter time span can still sell the amount of units and be profitable even with significantly shorter time frames. And like what what time frame are you suggesting here for like a $70 game? So for a $70 game, there are some genre nuance here, but I think a 20 to 30 hour duration window is actually an optimal window, especially if it's a more linear or wide linear, as people say, or Metrovania style. For the more open world uh, style games, I think their core content can stay within that 20 to 30 hours. And then the additional content of the open world can encroach on, say, the 40 hour to 45 hour mark. But growing to the 60 hour, 80 hour, or maybe even 100 hour plus in some game examples seems quite unnecessary and actually becomes a deterrent for some players as well. We saw this with Assassin's Creed Valhalla. One of the biggest criticisms of Valhalla was the game was too big, which is not a criticism actually you see very often. But in the case of something like an Assassin's Creed Valhalla, if we're looking at like an average playtime, obviously they're not building by the nature of how people play games. Not everyone's going to finish the game. The average player will not do the full completionist route. And as far as I understand about Ubisoft's business model, they're trying to aim for those kind of like 100-hour things so they can keep players 
playing that game to be able to then go on and sell DLC, MTX over time. If they go to the strategy, let's say with the Texas Assassin's Creed, they start playing into that 20 to 30 hour range. Is there trade-offs that they have to be aware of, of like business impacts of like, say, ASP for players leaving early or DLC MTX conversion given less players playing the game that would pull this down? Absolutely, there will be DLC trade-offs on the long tail revenue performance of those titles, 100%. You see that even just in comparison, comparing Mirage to Valhalla. Mirage has a very small amount of DLC and very little revenue coming from that aspect of the title, where Valhalla drives a fairly sizable chunk of revenue from that. So that is a trade-off for sure. Average sales price, I actually looked at a comparison of the post-launch average sales price trend of both Valhalla and Mirage. And in the first eight months, they actually follow pretty nearly the same trend. So it's not like these smaller titles are getting discounted at a quicker and higher rate. I also did the same comparison for Miles Morales and Spider-Man 2 for average sales price over time. And once again, their trend was almost identical for average sales price. So I don't think there's a significant trade-off other than the obvious difference in price to begin with. And is that average sales price or sort of cumulative? I'm just thinking like, when do players kind of pull into that sales curve? If it's average, that's more of a a measure of like the strategies. And obviously, Spider-Man and Assassin's Creed, they're probably going to use similar discount strategies. But cumulative, we'll be able to say like, hey, more people come into the sales curve later during those deeper discounts because they might see value differently for something like Mirage. So it was a combination. It is an average sales price, so it's a fair point on the cumulative side. But even when we look at the overall sales curve, the unit sale curve of both titles, they have very similar unit sales curves. Uh, So that plays out in the same way like you're talking about. Very interesting. Okay. And as we dive into something like Assassin's Creed and you look at Mirage and you look at Valhalla, Mirage was a lower price title and starting from that lower price point. If they go down to that 20 to 30, are they still able to go out at that 70 price point? And like that, because the the idea that I have in my head, and obviously this is different, is the like Hellblade 2 example, where they went down to that 50 price point and the hours that that game had, I forget, I think it was something like eight hours, that obviously drew a lot of criticism from players. Or something like Modern Warfare 3, where... Yes. Renowned. The campaign is insanely small. Yes. And even though they had all of the multiplayer content around it, there was a significant amount of discourse around that. So at that $70 price point with the 20 to 30 hours, I'm assuming there has to be some version of like, what's the differentiation? What's the quality difference? Like, are we talking about like a uncharted level, amazing golden path experience? Or are we talking more like the Assassin's Creed sort of like, Sorry to throw into Assassin's Creed on the bus, but thinking more like a more repeatable types of mission types. The expectation with a shorter, more condensed game is you get a higher level of entertainment value per hour. I think an idea that is the trade-off that you're making in reducing the overall scope of the game, you're able to more condensely put the quality per hour up. Like for example, Spider-Man 2, it was actually an 18-hour game for the core content length. So it's a very short game. But obviously the per hour entertainment value of that title is exactly kind of that that golden road that you're talking about. It's through the roof. And I didn't see very many people having issue with the length of that title, despite them being at that higher price point. So I do agree when developers shrink these titles, there is an expectation that they're getting a more condensed quality with the shorter level of hours. Yep. Yeah, I guess just to jump on that as well like even in the spider-man example there's all the discourse online around the amount of cost increases that they saw to even reach that 18 hours in order to go from spider-man's number up to spider-man 2 reaching 18 hours that quality of golden paths did take a significant amount of cost increase yeah yeah the, the last i saw was 300 million development costs i believe for getting to those 18 hours which is crazy and and what that highlights as well here is obviously game length is not the only lever to pull to pull down development costs. We need to be thinking of other ways to reduce development costs, especially for these AAA-sized titles. But what we're highlighting here is 
for many of these developers, there is room to reduce the scope of your titles. But then there's also room for these more smaller, compact experiences like Miles Morales, like Mirage, that can fit within your portfolio plan in between your larger releases. And they provide you interesting opportunities to test new mechanics, test new characters like Miles Morales, a lot of interesting areas for innovation, which is something I think a lot of AAA developers are going to lose out on as they now focus just on their biggest franchises uh, and cancel quite a few other projects. To go into that, like there's been the Uncharted 4 to Lost Legacy, I believe, like the smaller DLC version, then there's Spider-Man, Clowns Morales to Spider-Man 2. Or are you seeing success in those like smaller box products versus say if Miles Morales was a DLC to Spider-Man is the better approach to go with a brand new box product in between? That's maybe smaller scope. It's a little tricky to say, is it better? Um, I would argue it is. And for two different reasons. One, these smaller, more compact experiences are not attached to the original game in the same way that you're really only going to be able to access people who purchased the original Spider-Man. Whereas with Miles Morales, there's a very good chance you're going to access quite a few players who didn't actually originally purchase Spider-Man 1. And you might even then convert those players into Spider-Man 2 players, even though they didn't purchase the first or vice versa. So it potentially has the ability to access new players, along with having a slightly larger scope than a traditional DLC, gives you more room to test out characters, test out innovations in gameplay that might then show up in future iterations of that franchise. Okay, so I will from software that Shadow Bear Tree should have been a box for <laughs> uh, Miyazaki, you would have sold more, Miyazaki. Yeah. <laughs> uh, no, I'm even thinking that the context of like Elden Ring, could they have hit a, a larger player base if they had presented it as a new product alongside? It's a really interesting question because it essentially is like a separate game. The, the content length of that title how they structure the item system in that game. Like you very easily could have kind of ripped that game out and had it been a standalone title. I think in this case, the reality is Elden Ring sold so well that anyone interested in that type of Souls-like experience probably played Elden Ring already. And so the benefits that I was describing earlier are probably not really applicable in that situation. And Miyazaki made the right decision in this situation. Okay, we'll let them know. That's good. That's good. (laughs) Um, In transition here, so what we've been talking about, like the rising cost of premium single player game is the slate weakening for console, especially, as well as reading headlines about things like the rise of indie and the rise of double A. What is the current state of an indie and double A development? Is this a good time right now to launch as an indie or double A? I would say there's rarely been a better time, at least in 2024 to be an indie or a double-A developer. Now, as I highlighted earlier, I'm biased. I am a sucker for the indie scene, so maybe I'm a bit more than marginally optimistic on this part of the market. But the initial signs, at least from 2024, are super positive. We've already seen titles like Pal World, Sons of the Forest, and Shrouded, Bellatro, Manor Lords, pulling in incredibly strong commercial performances And really what's behind this is 2024 has been a light year for high impact AAA releases. So there's a lot of additional airspace available for these indie and double A developers to sneak in and get those headlines, get that visibility. And is it just a fraction of that or a function of that in terms of like, because there's less AAA, now there's more space for double A and indie. And given that development costs are going up, appetite for incubation is going down. Like, is, is it expected for outside of GTA 6 that these windows will continue to stay open in 26, 27? So it is a healthy time? So I would say, no, it's not just because of that. Of course, in 2023, we saw many very successful indie titles coming to mind. Dave the Diver, contentious whether that's indie or not, but that was a very successful indie title during a year of significant AAA releases. But it's certainly been a big benefit to the AA and indie space that we've seen a lack of these AAA titles. And when we look to the future, 
one unfortunate reality of the layoffs the industry has been experiencing over the last couple of years is many projects have been canceled. And so likely we'll see knock-on effects over the next four, five years where we'll have less AAA products or a smaller slate of AAA products coming each year, especially as a lot of AAA developers are really just focusing their efforts on their main franchises in the goal to de-risk their investments. So I do think, one, 2024 is a great year for the Indian AA's, but I think this is actually going to be a continuing trend as we look to the future. You believe the beneficiary of the lack of slate will not be the live service games. So people are transitioning from the lack of a premium game to a League of Legends or to a Dota. They're transitioning to Slay the Spire 2, let's say, for a specific example. Yeah, I, yeah absolutely. Absolutely. I'm very much looking forward to that game. But, yeah, of uh, course you are. Yeah. <laughs> we all are. <laughs> Uh, I've been holding off on Hades too as well. But yes, absolutely. I, so to answer your question, the players are already there. They're already there on those live service titles and sticking with them. But they're constantly taking vacations away from those live service titles. And so now the selection for those vacations is slimmer and they're far more likely to pick these AA uh, and Indie 8 titles for their vacation destination. And so I don't think it's that uh, these live service titles are just going to take more wallet share and playtime share as there are less AAA releases each year. Interesting. In terms of the AA space, there has been some headlines of struggling AA developers. So for example, like Alan Week 2, I believe last year they were talking about the sales coming in relatively weak for that title. There's also been a number of NDs coming out recently like Jonathan Lowe talking about like sales numbers for indies being significantly lower than expectations. What you're seeing is counter to that, that like those are just those specific games, but the overall market is actually quite healthy for indie and AA. From what we're seeing on our end for a more macro picture of the indie space, we are seeing healthy sales figures within the indie segment and the AA segment. Of course, there's quite a lot of nuance, like in the Alan Wake situation that was only launched on Epic Game Store which I got to believe probably had a fairly significant impact on its sales performance. But overall, we do believe we're still seeing a healthy market for the indie and double A scene. And it's a healthy market we expect to continue as we look to the future. And um, do you expect Switch 2 to be a lift to that market further or a detractor? I think it's a little too soon to say. I think probably for some types of more cozy indie developers, more narrative-driven indie developers, there certainly could be an opportunity there. But that opportunity mainly already exists with the Switch platform. So I'm not sure it'll represent a big opportunity for the Indian double A's folks. Okay, great. So I think we've covered a lot about premium games. Uh, let's transition to sort of the future of PC console, free-to-play, and live service titles. To kind of set the stage here, there's been a number of notable free-to-play live services that have struggled at launch. So notably things like Finals and X Defied Multiverses having struggles from those launch. Is it really bleak out there for new live services, or are you seeing success stories outside of those? I'm sad to say, yes, it is quite bleak for new live services, especially new free-to-play live services. Uh, so for example, if we just take the shooter genre to focus on, uh, as you mentioned already, we've seen the recent releases of the finals, X Defiant, and then on the horizon in the future, we have Splitgate 2, Concord, Delta Force, Spectre Divide, Marvel's Rival, all arriving within the next two years. I will be shocked if in three years, more than one of those titles is holding on to over a million monthly active users. And so which bet are you going to make? Which title will be that one title? <laughs> <laughs> oh, you're putting me in a danger zone, Adam. Uh, <laughs> yeah, right, right, right. <laughs> I will say the one I'm most interested in watching is Marvel Rivals, given its attachment to such a strong franchise. It'll be very interesting to see how that performs. Uh, but the rest, I'm a bit... Uh, it's just yeah, been yeah. interesting always watching these like pre-launch hype things of like Marvel Rivals. Obviously, I think feels like the sentiment is quite high for Marvel Rivals pre-launch. Yes. But even finals, 
you remember how crazy that beta was and how how much hype there was going into that. And then the shadow drop kind of the TGAs, 10 million downloads, but the retention wasn't there, right? Yeah. So I'm always yeah. kind of wondering like, how much can I really predict based on this, these pre-launch hypes and based on beta performance when post-launch these players aren't sticking to these live services? Yeah, it's, it's actually a really a double whammy because it's not only a retention problem for these games, but we're also seeing a conversion problem for a lot of these free-to-play games. When we went in and compared old free-to-play titles, so free-to-play titles that released prior to 2021 to newer titles, those old titles had a conversion rate roughly around 6.8%. Newer titles are sitting at an average conversion rate of about 3.6%. So we're seeing a massive drop-off in how these new titles are monetizing. So not only are they struggling to hold on to their players, they're also struggling to re- convert those players. It is it sort of like comparing business model or like to like, like cosmetics only to cosmetics only types of conversion drops? It, it doesn't seem like it's necessarily just a monetization drop like problem. Like for example, if you look at say Hearthstone, Hearthstone based on our data, we see a conversion of around 7.8%. Whereas Marvel Snap, a recent competitor is hovering around 3.6%. And that's specifically for a PC platform, not looking at mobile platform for those two titles. And Marvel Snap, it has some similar elements of a monetization strategy. We shouldn't be seeing such a drastic drop-off in conversion between these two very similar titles. Interesting. So th- both on the conversion side and on the retention side, are you just seeing a similar drop-off in terms of retention of post-2021 versus retention of pre-2021 title? Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. It's It looks a little dire for free-to-play titles that have released in the last three years. There are very few success cases that you can point to. Yeah. And within those cases, I think, is it execution? Like, is it the developers are just not coming out with enough features, with enough scope, with enough quality? Or is it actually that the audience is just not sticking them to them and returning back to their old live service? Obviously, this is complete speculation, but like, yeah. this is the million dollar question for This him. is the million dollar question. And if you asked me this question a year ago, I would probably say it's a live op strategy. A lot of these companies that are launching these new free to play titles, they're not adequately prepared for the post launch live ops. They don't have a strong enough content cadence release to stick these players. And that's why we're seeing this retention problem. But even with, say, like the finals, I've been following the finals relatively closely. I actually think Embark has done a decent job with their live op strategy around that title and their release of new content, new modes. It's kept me engaged as a casual gamer, but yet we've still seen a massive retention problem for that title. So I'm not convinced it's purely an execution mismanagement. What I think is actually happening really is it is incredibly difficult to pry these core shooter, MOBA, MMORPG fans away from their entrenched live service title. Even if you do everything correctly, you still might struggle to hold on to that audience. Wow. Okay. That's probably more than marginally negative now. <laughs> Okay. Uh, that's a little disappointing. I'm Canadian. I feel like I no, should. No, I'm Canadian too. This is like, a oh no, Adam. Kid, and this is not going to go well. <laughs> Where's our friendly, positive manner? We're letting our country down. <laughs> um, so, which games do you believe have actually reached that sort of escape velocity and become a successful life service over the last few years? So, I would, I would make a distinction here when I'm talking about this. There are two categories I see. There's the competitive live service titles, the titles that are really focused on competitive PvP game modes. And then there's the more cooperative PvE style live service games. Uh, Within that cooperative, I'm actually more marginally positive about this group of live service titles. Uh, Of course, we've seen Helldivers be a success, and we can touch on a little bit more on that category. But for the competitive live service space, we really have to go all the way back to 2020 when Valorant launched to see a successful free-to-play title that released or that had that exit velocity. Exit velocity? What was the term you used? Escape velocity, that's the one. (laughs) 
it, so we have to go back four years really to find uh, a successful example of a, a competitive live service title, which is quite far. Yeah, that it, even in the case of say like Overwatch Two, what scale have they been able to reach? Yeah, Overwatch Two is a funny one. I don't really think of Overwatch Two as a newly released title, to be honest. Um, they have actually been able to, despite a rocky transitionary period, they have been able to sustain a reasonably solid audience post the launch of Overwatch 2. Yeah, okay. As we go in deeper here then, like as we extrapolate from this insight, that the assumption here is that it's not necessarily just execution, that it's getting harder and harder to stick these audiences away from their existing live services. And we compare that to the trend in Asia, where engagement became increasingly and increasingly more concentrated. But obviously in Asia, there still are new live services that blow up and are, are still successful. So plenty of live service successes in Asia. Is this kind of like continual concentration inevitable or really get to the point where there is sort of like healthy adoption and shifts between live services like we see in Asia? I had a colleague make the comparison to me the other day that these live service titles have now become like sports. Like League of Legends is like basketball and it's internal and in that people are just sticking with basketball. They might go and try another sport, but they're always going to keep coming back to basketball. I'm not convinced that's the case, but there's no data at this point to suggest that these long-standing live service titles are going to see an end. Fortnite still probably going to be the king for a very long time. League of Legends, Valorant, these titles. League of Legends little questionable in their aging audience and their difficulty bringing in new players. That's probably the biggest challenge for many of these long-standing live service titles is bringing in the younger audience. So if we were going to see a shift in the future where we get a more healthy transition between different live service titles, I would wager it's off the back of the new generation of gamers that are exiting Roblox and looking for different experiences. Okay, so into that aging out category, which yeah. is similar to like Minecraft to Fortnite, when like their their strategy yes. at that time. So as sort of like a PC console live developer, you're saying, look at the aging out of the Roblox audience, how can you capture that audience? Is there any other tactics that you would take given the level of competition, like embracing sort of like embracing lower adoption and trying to aim for sort of lower now, higher retention games? If you fall into that co-op PVE live service style bucket, what I think you need to do is embrace the lower retention reality. So what that means is monetizing up front. So don't go with a free to play approach. Make sure you're charging up front some type of soft premium 20 to $40 seems like the optimal range for that soft premium. And then accepting the fact that you're going to have a very peak and trough engagement curve and having a monetization strategy based on maximizing your conversion in those peaks, because you're not going to be able to retain a very stable audience. They'll probably come and go as you have major content releases. And that's just something you need to embrace and plan for in your monetization strategy. For the competitive PvP live service, this is a tougher one. If you're a major publisher, if you're Riot, if you're Blizzard, it's realistically going to come down to spending a significant amount of money to try to acquire enough players to hit a scale that even if you have retention issues, you're still going to land at a sustainable engagement level. But even that is a massive risk. And for smaller developers who are coming into that competitive PvP style service, I think you're facing a very difficult challenge, but I would recommend probably trying to launch quicker, expect the fact that you're going to have a low initial adoption and try to stay lean and grow organically over time with a smaller audience. Very interesting. Okay. So much bleaker perspective, but at the same time, hopefully ways to navigate to try to add a little bit of optimism in the end here, what do you think could happen in terms of that would cause that pendulum swing to start swinging the other way for developers going after live service? To be honest, I, I, I go back to the, the aging reality and the maturity curve because there is an absolutely massive crowd of people playing Roblox at the moment. And I have a very tough time believing that that 
crowd as they age up and they mature through their gaming experience is going to stay with Roblox. I apologize, Roblox, but I think they're going to have a very difficult time retaining that audience. And so I think over the next five to 10 years, we're going to see that audience decide on what their live service title is that they're going to stick with. And we don't know yet if they're going to just jump to the existing live service titles in the market, or if they're going to be more interested in new experiences, new genre blends, things that we can't even imagine at the moment that really capture those audiences. So for a lot of developers, I would taking a close look at what are the play patterns arising in these UGC platforms, these custom game modes, because those might be very predictive of what the genres of tomorrow are. We've already seen this with MOBAs coming from a mod in Warcraft. Battle Royale started as a Hunger Games mod in Minecraft. So there will be evolutions and there will be developers who capitalize on those evolutions. One place to potentially get a head up on that is maybe looking at these UGC platforms to indicate what those might be. Okay, there we go. There's our optimistic end. I like that. That's good. So kind of like going back through our key points today, we talked a lot about the market and that how it's moved up. Our optimism, slight optimism on mobile now, uh, largely driven by heavy header titles. The Xbox ecosystem being slightly negative, um, given the cross-platform titles. Switch 2 being sort of business as usual. PC and the rise of Steam being a lot of beneficiaries of cross-platform plays with a lot of players coming onto the PC platform. So overall, PC consoles look good, especially with GTA 6 coming out next year. But still with the difficulties here in terms of premium games, where premium games have been relatively stable on a revenue perspective. However, the costs have been growing. So talking through what are those cost mitigation strategies? How do you avoid escalating costs with stable revenue? Talking about things like playtime, the rise of indie and AAA. So while investment appetite for solid slate will be going down, that will actually leave room for these AA and indie titles to take advantage. And then lastly, in terms of the future of PC console and free to play live services, talking through the relatively bleak perspective around how difficult retention and conversion has been for these titles to become viable, especially sort of in the competitive space and with some strategies here on taking sort of a zag on the market and, and not going directly competitive with PVP titles that are already sort of taking up all the year that we've seen in the space. Any other sort of like key takeaways we should leave the audience with? Maybe I'll make one last point uh, and I'll end it here. And this is almost a bit of a plead to publishers and the VCs who are watching this podcast, uh, given my love for indies and AA, I really encourage patience with your indie and AA developers in your portfolio. I'll give you a couple of examples. Pocket Pair, the folks behind Pal World, they took three games to get to Pal World. Arrowhead Games, the folks behind Helldivers 2, they took four games to get to Helldivers 2. Supergiant Games, the folks behind Hades, also took four games to get to Hades. And there's many more examples like this with the indie and the AA space. So I'm concerned a lot of teams are going to get abandoned because they're not reaching those levels of successes in their first title. But it's really for most of these companies, it's not till like the third or fourth title when they hit that level of success. So for all the publishers and the VCs listening, I really encourage you to be patient with those studios, those teams that you have invested in and give them the space to grow, you'll likely see the dividends of that in the future. Amazing. So thanks a lot for taking the time. I love the level of depth we can get into. And um, amazing to have you on the pod. Happy to have you again as we talk through more of the forecast of this change. So it was really cool to be here. Thank you, Adam. You did it. You made it to the end of the episode. As a fan of the show, it would help us out if you subscribe and leave us a review on the podcast service of your choice. More importantly, are you a member of the Deconstructor of Fun Slack group? If you have five years or more of games industry experience, go to deconstructoroffun.com slash slack and apply to join. Join the games industry's best professional community filled with peers always willing to lend a hand. Or subscribe to our newsletter to get all the latest insights from the Deconstructor of Fun content creators. Thanks for listening.